If you were Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs would be your weird younger brother. A lot of people don't take him seriously, they never really gave him a shot, but deep down he's got a lot to offer for the people who are actually his friends. Watch Dogs is pretty similar. This is a game that was marred with controversy, and I do want to actually take some time to talk about it today because I ended up playing through this game and I loved it. I absolutely loved the first Watch Dogs. I know, I know, but I'm going to present my case here today the best I can and talk about my experience with this game while also addressing its past. I had never played through Watch Dogs before, and I took people's word that it was disappointing, and there were a lot of reasons why people thought that. Before we go further, if you enjoy this, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and we'll hop back in. But to address the controversy that Watch Dogs brought to the table for Ubisoft, this game was revealed in 2012 with better graphics and performance than it would inevitably launch with when it was released in 2014. This downgrade was essentially the straw that broke the camel's back in the gaming industry, as players had been dealing with this so, so much before. It had happened many, many times with different games. The industry standard for many games was to actually show off those games on a PC that was comparable to console specifications instead of showing it off on the hardware it was intended for. It was also a standard practice at the time to show off the ideal version of a game to impress the audience and wow them with a tech demo level of new technology instead of actually being realistic as a company, as a publisher, or as a developer and showing what would be given to the consumer. This also had happened with a game like Dark Souls 2, which almost completely scrapped its very impressive lighting system that it had at its reveal by the time the game was released, with only small parts of that lighting system left, despite it originally being a selling point, and later on from software kinda, you know, allegedly admitting that they knew that it wasn't working right when they showed it off. Because of that controversy, and because this was something very, very common at the time, I am not excusing it, what they did, but I am saying that this common industry practice, people really did take it out on Watch Dogs because they were sick and tired of seeing that crap, and it was under a lot of scrutiny at launch, where people went into the game wanting to play what they originally saw and not at all taking the game for what it was. That's understandable and it's justified, but it is worth mentioning that that hype that the studio themselves purposely built up hurt their game quite a bit. Because I never cared about this game when it was launching, nor did I pay any attention to any of that stuff at all, uh, you know, I really just deferred to the general consensus that it wasn't what it promised to be, and I never took any sort of chance on it. But one of the first things I always have heard about Watch Dogs is that the characters are too edgy and serious, and that this detracts from the fun of the overall game. Any of you who know the history of the franchise also know that this would be course corrected in Watch Dogs 2 and then Legion, however Legion would end up with a lack of cohesive story where they would bring back some of those serious elements later on. Now, I do want to say that this is a similar criticism, the edgy and seriousness, that was given to a game like Assassin's Creed 3, and while both of those games have their faults, this is not one of the faults I found with either of them. I thought that Aiden Pierce, much like Connor in the Assassin's Creed games, was well written as someone who had essentially undergone a tragedy that they were recovering from, or going through a lot with. Aiden Pierce was well written as someone who had gotten a member of his own family killed and was out for vengeance, and over the course of the game he does go through a character arc that sees him becoming something of a deranged savior for the city of Chicago. I never thought he was any more edgy or depressing than some of the almost universally praised characters like Batman, Logan, or even Showtime's Dexter, and his reactions and behavior made sense for who he is if you are willing to accept that this guy is also kind of nuts and not the best person in the world by any means morally. He's very clearly trying his best to do what he believes is right, but he's also clearly a bit of a lunatic with control issues, paranoia, and a lack of trust for anyone around him. I will say I do wish that the game had explored Aiden's mind a little bit more 
personally, I'm not saying send him to therapy, but something where we got to see why his brain works a little bit more the way it does. They did a lot of showing and not telling, which is usually good, but I personally think that his stoicism and his rough closed off personality didn't connect with a lot of people, and it may have connected with them if the game had gone a little more in depth with it and written more into the story about why he is the way he is. This most definitely is not a superhero game, but I found it interesting how you start as this really selfish guy who went through a lot of trauma and finally ended up becoming more concerned with preventing tragedies happening to other people than he was with his own well-being. That's very much like a character like Batman, you know, this is a character that is scarred by emotional trauma, who went through a lot of crap and came out the other side a little messed up but also trying to prevent what happened to him happening to other people. This obviously leads to a character who often isolates himself and pushes others away. This does make him come off edgy, and I understand that, especially to extroverts. And he goes through the game becoming more skilled and developing a persona as the vigilante, which is what the people in Chicago refer to him as. I'm actually surprised that people didn't connect more with this aspect of the game, as it's sort of a mix between a modern day Assassin's Creed game and Grand Theft Auto, except that you essentially go around punishing and preventing crimes and advancing your abilities as you go throughout the game. Aiden reminded me a lot of popular comic book characters such as the Punisher, who are renowned for the vigilantism and stoicism that they carry, so I can't really see why these same aspects are somehow a fault for this character, except that it was very different than a lot of stuff that Ubisoft did at the time. Worth mentioning, a character like Altair and Connor are both very similar to Aiden in terms of their stoicism, their self-driven character traits, and also just kind of paranoia and not trusting people and keeping to themselves with some naivety, but it's not always a character type that has connected with fans of Ubisoft games. A lot of times the more fun-loving, you know, uh, extroverted characters like Ezio or even, uh, you know, Edward, those are characters that really connect with people for these games. So I understand why some people were put off by this with Aiden, but I think it really does work for him. Hold on, hold on. Stop. Who's assigned to the prison job? What? Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Lance Brenner. As a family. What are you doing? I'm asking how your family is. Looks like you got two lives going at once, family man. Yeah, the kids are going to be in college soon. It's pricey for a union rep. Fuck you. Yeah, and there's also the second life. Ghost accounts with a lot of money in them. Hey. Do you know that your name is tied to a whole bunch of cold cases? I bet the cops would love a chat. Okay, hold on. You want a piece of the cash? I can cut you in. You're wasting my time. All right, all right! Fuck. Prison job. It's Angelo Tucci. He's running a convoy. It's too late. You'll never find him. He says I want him. I bet he's got a family in town. Why do you want his family? The fuck is wrong with you? I wouldn't know where to begin. It's worth mentioning that supporting characters in this game like Clara and T-Bone were also actually very interesting and they did contribute to the plot of the game without leaving you as a player feeling like you were completely on your own. T-Bone in particular has a lot of comedic relief to provide to the game, which makes him a much more personable character and easy to connect with than Aiden, despite his craziness that he has as well. That plays well off of Aiden in almost a buddy cop movie fashion where Aiden is what you call the straight man, uh, you know, like the very serious, you know, edgy, stoic guy, and T-Bone is the kind of funny one. But I will say the shame is that T-Bone was not in this game enough. He was introduced later on in the story, so I feel like he didn't have as much time to shine as he should have, and these two characters didn't have enough time to play off of each other. 
Clara comes off the same way to me because she's a very interesting character that just isn't in this game enough. And it's really a shame because if they had added more to their individual stories, Clara and T-Bone would probably be considered standout Ubisoft game characters. As is, I know that T-Bone is a bit of an iconic meme character to people who know of Watch Dogs, kind of think Duck Dynasty meets Lunatic Hacker, but Clara is often just forgotten in the context of this series. She in particular had a lot of chemistry with the character of Aiden Pierce that wasn't given enough on-screen time. And I also really do believe that if they had focused on these characters a bit more, the criticism of Aiden's seriousness and the game's tone would not have been so heavy from a lot of players, because he would have had a lot more time to blend with and play off of these other well-written characters instead of just being left to Aiden's own thoughts for 80% of the game when he's a very unstable person, which obviously is not going to click right with a lot of people. It's worth mentioning that even an unstable character like Aiden Pierce is likable if you take the time to understand why he is the way he is and what he's doing. I found myself often understanding and agreeing with things that he was doing despite them being bad. He has a very interesting way of carrying himself that helps convince the player that you're not actually in the wrong, even when some of your decisions are slightly morally dubious at times for the greater good of the city around you, your family, and other people in the game. The world of Watch Dogs is also very interesting, and I was surprised how many different playable vehicles were in the game. For example, th this world is pretty fleshed out, and I don't ever hear people talking about it when they talk about these open world 3D RPG-like games. I would call this sort of a character-driven RPG in the same way Assassin's Creed is, but it's also action-driven. Yet I don't hear many people talk about the world in this game. It definitely was helped by the FPS boost now offered on Xbox Series X where I played the game, which made it feel mostly smooth. There, you know, there's a few exceptions that didn't take me out of the game, but you know, they they did happen. By the way, I play Fallout for fun, so that should tell you that I don't care that much about performance issues anyway. But the FPS boost really did help smooth that out and make it a really fun experience. However, I'm sure it would also be fun in 30 FPS on a different console. It's worth mentioning that Chicago in this game is very interesting just in general, and it's home to a ton of NPCs who have different backgrounds and game purposes, though most of them are just there to read some funny or incriminating tidbits and lore text, and also to steal money from. Again, Aiden is not the best person ever, and he's basically a homeless guy who roams between shipping containers and bases that he squats in. He's not really getting paid, so it's up to you who you take money from. You can use your phone to take money from people's bank accounts, and you can see information about those people. Maybe some of them are legitimate sex addicts. That's an actual thing in the game. Maybe some of them have looked up uh, illegal images online. Maybe some of them are ex-convicts or are, you know, broke out of prison, things like that. Those are things that you see in the actual character text that pops up when you highlight a person with your phone, which is interesting because it does make every NPC feel unique, even though a lot of them are copies of other ones, which again is something I hear later games get even better with. So if that's something I liked in this game, I can't wait to see how good that is by the time of something like Legion. It's worth mentioning too, with this though that I do wish that the game actually had some sort of consequences for who you were stealing from. There is a system in place where if you steal from a Bloom agent you might get hacked or essentially uh, there are these people in the game to break it down with a TLDR who work for one of the companies in the game. If you happen to hack one of those persons there might be a small repercussion for what you're doing, but for the most part there just isn't. And I do think it would have been more interesting for this game if you had been gaining something like positive reputation or karma from stealing from the bad guys, or negative from stealing from the good or sympathetic characters. Instead the game will just kind of guilt trip you by telling you you're stealing from a US military veteran or someone with stage 3 or 4 cancer, but there's no consequence to taking that money beyond you just being a dick. Your reputation does go up and down as a vigilante in the game depending on your actions in terms of if you use unnecessary violence, say someone grabs a wallet and you shoot them in the back of the head executioner style, that is seen by people around you as unnecessary violence. However, if someone pulls a gun on someone and you pull a gun and shoot them, that's not seen as unnecessary violence and that actually increases your reputation 
as a hero. I, it's very similar to the Red Dead Redemption honor system, where you can sort of go either way. Uh, you're never full supervillain, but you're either more honorable or completely dishonorable. The system in this game works fairly similar to that, and I do wish that it was affected by more things than just you accidentally killed a civilian or you used some unwarranted violence or something like that. Uh, it would have been neat to see more things affect that vigilante system because it's a really cool system as is. One thing that really impressed me was the interactivity of this world as well because they really deliver on the premise of the overall game. Everything in the world is connected and you have control of many different parts of this world. Not only can you interact with other characters' digital profiles, bank accounts, etc., but you can also change things in the world like overloading power conduits, hacking cameras, microphones, roadblocks, vehicles, and more. The weapons in this game are also really fun, but I will say you can tell Ubisoft wasn't super used to making this type of game at the time it came out. There is some clunkiness to certain guns and just gunfire in general, along with the driving. The driving in this game is probably one of the most egregious issues it has. Driving cars, motorcycles, trucks, and boats, and more doesn't really bother me while playing, but the turning on each of these vehicles and their handling, it's pretty bad. You can tell that they had to prioritize certain aspects of this game in different orders. While playing it, for me, it felt like the hacking and cover systems were the top priority of the game, with gunplay and stealth kind of coming in second, and driving dead last, like the lowest priority in terms of its gameplay. I've played games with much worse driving in them than this, but it's a bit of a shame that your primary method of getting around the city it could have been a lot more fun if more work and time had gone into it, especially because there are a lot of missions in this game that involve car chases, which, when you have a car that does not handle well, is actually kind of annoying. Speaking of annoying, this game did have some bugs that really irritated me. One of them was that the game spoils a major twist early on by playing it on the radio before it's actually happened in game. I don't want to get specifically too far into this twist because I'm trying to tell you parts of the story while also maybe getting you to check this game out if you haven't. I don't want to just tell you everything that happens, but there is a major twist in the game later on that you're not expecting that is then spoiled early on in the radio. It doesn't happen, I believe, until Act 4 of the game. Every act has its own chapter missions, etc. Uh, but for me, this glitch happened at the end of Act 1. So I was hearing about this throughout the entire game, and when it eventually happened, it had no impact for me. I think glitches like that, along with the handling of the cars and that kind of stuff, it could have really helped the game have more impact, feel more fluid, and connect with more players, because players were already going into this game eagle-eyed. I'm not saying anyone who doesn't like it is like a hater who just was unhappy with the, with the original reveal, but there were a lot of people already going in very skeptical because of that downgrade situation, and you needed to put your best foot forward as a game in a situation like that where people are going to be more critical and find this stuff more easily instead of just excusing it. A lot of games have a lot of good faith and good graces in the gaming community, and people can look past some of their faults, things like Fallout New Vegas, for example. People can look past the faults knowing the history of its rush development, of what Bethesda kind of put uh, Obsidian under for working conditions, and also just how good the Fallout series is. There are a lot of people who give that kind of game good graces and a pass on a lot of its issues. Me being one of them, it's my favorite game ever. But a game like this that was already under controversy was not gonna get that pass, and so to be lazy with these glitches or the car handling, for example, that was not a good move. Another good example of things that could have been actually improved in this game with the car handling is the fact that during those high-speed chases, especially with police or criminals, there are consequences for your actions. If you accidentally clip and injure or kill a civilian with your car, you lose vigilante reputation for that because you are seen as someone who recklessly got someone killed or straight up murdered them on purpose, depending on how you're playing this game. Uh, you could take a car and just drive down the sidewalk and mow people down, but you are going to essentially be punished for that. But my issue with this is not that there are consequences for my actions, 
it's that I don't always have control of my actions. A good example of this is that the car handling is so bad and the police push you around so much on the road that there are times when citizens don't know where to go and they will blatantly run out into the street or into a sidewalk right in front of your car and get killed. The game doesn't account for that NPC's stupidity, they just think you're being a dumbass and they punish you and your reputation for it. One nice thing though about this game is that the city is packed with activities from retrieving vehicles to clients, or for clients, to stopping criminal convoys, to exploring gang hideouts and shutting them down, to random hacking jobs and side quests that develop over the course of the main story, and if that doesn't sound like enough for you for gameplay outside of the main story, it does have a random crime system similar to a game like Spider-Man PS4 or Batman Arkham Origins. There's always somewhere to go. I will say that sometimes you, you can get a little frustrated at the frequency of the random crimes, at least if you're me, feeling like you have to get involved in them, but you can also just ignore them like in a game like Spider-Man, where if you don't want to deal with it, you just move on past it. There was a system in place where you could hack another player's game to steal resources, or they could hack yours, and the player on the receiving end of the hack would have to hunt down an in-game NPC who was the hacker and stop them. It was a really fun little activity, though it probably would have annoyed me if I had played the game at launch and was dealing with it all the time. This did happen twice during our game, I will say. One time, and this is the only time I got to do it, was during a tutorial where they teach you about it. The other time it did happen to my wife Jill who was playing, I don't have footage of that. But essentially what happens is an NPC is in the game, you have to track them down. And while it is interesting, it's also very obnoxious because that NPC is really hard to find and a lot of NPCs look really similar, making this both a fun and obnoxious aspect of the game that I am personally glad I did not have to deal with very much. Think the Soulsborne games invasion system, except that there's a ton of different characters and you have to guess which one is actually the one that is trying to ruin your game. Where's Waldo with guns where you're punished for making the wrong choice? Sounds great on paper, it's a neat idea, but I'm glad I didn't have to deal with it too much. Earlier during the review we talked about the characters, but something more specific I did want to mention is the story itself. I'm not going to be getting into very, very specific things like the ending of the game mainly because I think it's a bit silly to come out here telling you how much I love this game and how much I thought it's worth your time and then to just spoil the entire story. But I do want to say that I thought this game had a very engaging story that felt high impact. In the very first few minutes, you do learn that essentially you are on a path of revenge because a family member of Aiden's is tragically killed, and this is a this is a story element that affects him for the entire game. This is sort of a driving force behind who he is. I will say that the character writing was on point for this, and like I previously mentioned, I'd even put this game up there above or with some of the Assassin's Creed games in terms of story. I really do think it's better than quite a few of the Assassin's Creed game stories are and more down to earth, however there's plenty of Assassin's Creed's that also absolutely blow this out of the water. You're on a revenge character arc throughout this that eventually transitions into something of a redemption story for Aiden, and it reminded me a lot of the character journey of Altair from Assassin's Creed 1, who in my opinion is one of the best written assassins in that franchise. Altair starts off as pretty much just a cocky jerk who gets his friends killed and dishonors the Order of Assassins. He's stripped of his rank and he slowly has to work his way back up within that order, relearning things that made him an assassin and finding humility and developing as a person as he goes in the story of Assassin's Creed 1. The story of Watch Dogs very much mirrors that, where you start out as an expert who thinks you know everything, you think you're untouchable, but being met with this family tragedy pushes Aiden over an edge into living out a revenge fantasy that eventually evolves into something more than that. Again, this was a very comic book-like story that I would see fans of superheroes or vigilantes enjoying, or at least fans of anti-heroes, as it's much closer to that role in a comic book. This game was also extremely culturally relevant even today, as the last few decades in the real world have seen a rise of government surveillance and control worldwide as a cause for both panic, concern, and paranoia, along with a feeling of safety for different groups. This is sort of an idea of who watches the Watchmen, or who keeps the people with all the power who are keeping others in check, in check. 
It's an interesting question that plays into the game throughout its runtime, and it is taken seriously and not as a joke. I really love that aspect of the game. The game made me think while I also had fun with pretty much everything I did, and I felt like I was living in the world of Chicago, which is saying something for this game being more than a handful of years old already. Overall, I ended up leaving this game extremely impressed with the characters, the world, the gameplay, and the story. There's definitely things I would change, like the driving being laughably rough, some side characters not having enough time in the main narrative, and the ending of some of the side quests as some of them kind of peter out and just sort of end anticlimactically. But the game's positives far outweighed its negatives and left me excited to play more games in this franchise and it made me walk away from the game feeling like an accomplished vigilante who went on a full character driven story in a very lively world that was interconnected by technology. I'd recommend this game to anyone who's a fan of vigilante stories from characters like Batman to Red Hood to Punisher and the Assassin's Creed franchise or even open world games in general and I think it's really too bad that Ubisoft's negligence in its marketing early on left a stain on the reputation of this game permanently. Many people went into this game with a negative opinion already, as was their right, because they felt tricked or deceived by the company, and they ended up missing out on a really fun game or just not enjoying it because of valid criticisms that they had and a feeling that they took into the game, which was more Ubisoft's fault than fans. Ubisoft had set the game up to be reviewed against what people wanted it to be and against what they had hyped it up to be, instead of setting fans up to review it and experience it for what it would be because of their reveal. And that's just kind of sad to me. It's something where I think they kind of made their own bed and a lot of the reputation of this first game was earned because of negligence and dishonesty in the marketing that ended up hurting it overall. But as a game itself, I absolutely loved it. I had a fantastic time and I can't wait to play more games in the series. This has become up there as one of my favorite games, believe it or not, and I can't wait to play through it again as well, which I will likely let's play it in the future with my wife Jill. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe for more content, let me know what you're thinking in the comments down below. I did my best to break down this game and review it as best as I could. I had a fantastic time, and I loved making this video because it's been a while since I properly reviewed a game. These aren't videos that typically get a ton of views, they aren't videos that typically get spread around on YouTube, but when I'm passionate about a game and really enjoy it like this, I just want to talk about it, and I want to share it with you guys. Interested to hear your thoughts down below in the comments, please be sure to check out uh, links and stuff in the description down below, including our Let's Play channel, all of our social media, my wife's wonderful Etsy store, which goes to help support the channel that she does a fantastic job on, everything else. I'll see you in the next one. Have a fantastic day. And as always, everyone, stay shway.